Hide and Scene by Robert Parra. The characters are Alexis, 18, shy and beautiful, and Anissa, 40, single mom, and Alexis's mother. The setting is the beach house on a beautiful Sunday morning. At Rise, Alexis is helping her brother Alex with boxes while mom is standing by. OMG, I've been waiting for this letter for months. Why are you so happy for? Who is it from? The army, mom. Did you say the army? <sighs> Why are they writing my little girl? Because I signed up for the army, mom. I didn't tell you because I knew you wouldn't be okay with it. And talk me out of it. I can't believe you would do this. How are you gonna leave me and your brother and Alex? What are you? Mom, please don't make this about you. What about what I want? You will only think of yourself. You will not do this to me. Please, Mom, sit down. Perhaps we can go inside and talk about this. We are not talking about this. Alexa, you will not go, and that is the end of this. This is not fair. Why can't you understand? This is my dream. Same thing I have to do. I'm done, and I won't speak about this matter again. I'm leaving, if you like it or not. Alexa runs off to her room. End of scene. Everybody Goes Through Something by Carlos Vasquez. The characters are Greg, 29, an army veteran with a lame leg, Lisa, Greg's wife, 27, and later we'll meet Monica, their roommate, who's 31. The setting is an apartment, present day. At rise, Lisa is shouting at Greg. Monica's in her room trying to sleep. You are such an idiot. I swear that dead leg of yours has impacted your brain. I'm sorry. I know you're sorry. A sorry excuse for a husband. I think you're overacting, Lisa. Really? Well, maybe I need to break it down to you. Lisa, please. By you not waking me up on time, you have made me late for work, meaning I can be fired, you ignorant fool. Okay, you're right. I was wrong. Now, would you please keep your voice down? You're going to wake up Monica. I don't care. If she doesn't like it, she can move out. Why do you keep putting me through this? As if I haven't been through it enough. I don't care about what you went through in that stupid war. Get over it. Would you at least consider going to couples therapy? I think we can- Hell no. I don't need some stranger all up in my business. I gotta go. I don't have time for this. Lisa exits. <sighs> God, please give me the strength to divorce this woman. Are you okay? Uh, yeah. I'm good. Sorry about the noise. It's cool. I'm used to it. You know, you shouldn't be putting up with all that, right? With all of what? With the abuse. It's not abuse. If it's not abuse, what is it? It's just Lisa being Lisa. I know abuse when I hear it. Believe it or not, I was in an abusive relationship with my ex. Really? Wow. What happened? Well, at first I tried to downplay it like you're doing. God, I hated that word abuse. It made me feel weak, but that's exactly what it was. I had to accept that. How did you escape it? I sought help, Dr. Lawler. He helped me find my strength. You should contact him. He can help you. Nah, Lisa would never go with me. She doesn't have to go. This is about you. All you have to do is show up. Dr. Lawler will handle the rest. I don't know. I doubt he can help us. I'm really all jacked up. Craig, what is it that you want more than anything else in your life? Oh, that's easy. I just want to be happy. And you deserve that. But you have to get out of this abusive relationship or you'll never be happy. Do you really think this guy can help me find the courage to divorce her? I really do. And I really want you to see him. I, I want you to see that you get the happiness that you deserve. It's been so long since anyone actually cared about me. Thank you. Well, I think you're an amazing man. A real hero. You fought for our country, for God's sake. You shouldn't have to fight a battle here, too. You know what? You're right. I do deserve to be happy. I'll go see that doctor. End of scene. Scene two. Uh, we have Greg, and then we'll meet Dr. Lawler, a middle-aged psychologist. It's two days later, and they're in Dr. Lawler's office. Greg has just entered. Hello, doctor. Thank you for seeing me on such short notice. No problem. 
Welcome, please have a seat. Thank you. So, Greg, is it okay if I call you Greg? Sure. Why are you here today? Uh, I told my roommate I'd come and see you. Is that the only reason? Well, I've been having problems with my wife. What kind of problems? We fight a lot. Well, actually, she does the fighting. You don't fight back? No. I don't like confrontation. Okay. Is she abusive toward you? Well, she disrespects me, disregards me. Uh, she punches me in the face before, so yeah, I would say she's abusive. I see. So you're obviously unhappy with your marriage. Definitely. I haven't felt happy in years. I feel like the only way I can be happy again is to, to divorce my wife. Okay. So why don't you? What's keeping you in this toxic marriage? I don't know, doctor. I'm sorry. I don't know why I put up with it. It's not like I love her anymore. It's okay, Greg. It's all right to feel confused. I can help you figure it out. So tell me about your past. I noticed you injured your leg. Let's start there. Tell me about that. It was an IED. My convoy ran into some heavy enemy fire. We were all overrun, so we fled. Next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital. Go on. I came out of a coma to find out my entire unit was, was dead. I'm sorry about your loss, and thank you so much for your service. But be honest with me, Greg. How does that event make you feel? Truthfully, I feel I should have died with my unit that day. Do you feel as though your unit abandoned you? Why did I survive? They left me. We were supposed to ride and die together. That was our motto. I shouldn't be here. I should be with my team. Listen to me, Greg. You are suffering from issues of abandonment. You have to stop feeling guilty for surviving. But they were all I had. They were my only family. And then one day, go on. Just like that. You're right. They are gone. But that was their calling, not yours. You still have a purpose here. Your life still has meaning. I'm afraid of being alone. Abandoned. Again. Is that why you're clinging on to your abusive wife? Fear of that sense of abandonment again? That's what it is, isn't it? I never thought about it that way. I think you're accepting your abusive relationship with your wife because you feel if you don't... Lisa will abandon me. Exactly. So... Is there any way you can overcome that feeling now that you know you've identified it? I think I can, doctor. I believe with a little help, I can go through this divorce and finally be happy. Good. And I think we both know someone that would be willing to help you through it. You mean Monica? I think she would gladly help you. Okay. I'll do it. I feel like a giant weight has been lifted off my shoulders. Greg, I believe you are ready to make the necessary changes to get the happiness you want. Thank you, doctor. No problem. My chair is always available if you need to talk. One thing I know for sure is that everybody goes through something. It's my job to help. End of scene. Scene three, we're back at Greg's apartment 30 minutes later. Greg enters the apartment looking for Lisa. Lisa, where are you? Lisa went to the store. She'll be right back. How'd it go with Dr. Lawler? You won't believe it. I had a breakthrough. You were right about him. See, I told you he would help you. I feel like a new man. You look like a new man. You look happy. 
I am. I feel confident and ready to make a big change in my life. What are you going to do? I'm going to divorce Lisa. It's over. Really? Oh my God, I'm so happy you found your courage. When are you going to do it? As soon as she comes back. Well, I should go then and give you some privacy. No, I need you to stay. I need you to be here when I do it. But why? While talking to Dr. Lawler, I discovered I had developed abandonment issues. That's why I haven't been able to divorce Lisa. I'm afraid of being on my own. I need you here with me to do it. Okay, I'm here to support you. Where the hell have you been? And why do you have that stupid look on your face? Lisa, I want a divorce. <laughs> you need to stop it. What is this, a prank or something? This is not a joke. I'm dead serious about this. It's over. I want you to get your stuff and get out. You're not kidding. Greg, what's going on here? Does she have something to do with this? Actually, she does. Monica helped me realize that I deserve better than you. I think maybe I should leave. Yeah, I think you should, you home wrecker. Oh, don't talk to her like that. Oh, now you defending this? Ugh. Just stop. Look, Lisa, he doesn't want to be with you anymore. He's tired of your abuse. And to be honest, I'm tired of hearing your mouth. Thank you, Monica. She's white, Lisa. I'm done with you. I don't love you anymore, and I'm going to need that divorce. Fine. I will send someone to gather my stuff. I hope you're happy. Are you okay? I'm good. Thank you for being here. No worries. I'm proud of you. I know that wasn't easy for you. But it was necessary. I feel good. I actually feel happy now. You feel like you can start a new life now? I do. And it feels okay to know that I'm on my own now. Well, you're not entirely on your own. You still got me. I guess that's right. You've been a very good friend. Because of you and Dr. Lawler, I was able to get the happiness I wanted. Glad I could help. Hey, someday you can share your spirit experience with another person in need of some help. I will because if there's anything that I'm sure about, it's that everybody is going through something. End of play. Set in My Ways by Paul Kaiser. Scene one, Mind's Eye and Mind's Set are in a cave it is a massive cave on the coast of Denmark in the North Sea. I'm moving, yet it feels though I'm still and all else is moving. Nonetheless, I, I get to where I'm going, hopefully to find the source of this voice. I've heard nothing for so long. Someone approaches. What is this? Do you seek? Do you teach? Which of us does which? Do we do both? What is this presence seeking my voice? I've been speaking for so long. I am seeking something out, but I, I can't barely hear it. The thing I seek is so quiet. If I find this quietness, won't I be versing with myself? Oh, here it comes. Closer now. What do you want? Want is what your eyes seek. The eyes seek a want. It's what they do. It's in their nature. Just close them a while and relax. I must be getting so close now. Yes, yeah, getting quieter and quieter. Yes, I will relax my eyes and shut them for a moment. I think I can hear the sound of water. I can hear it bubbling around the stones, making a really nice sound. Scene two, we're in the cave on a stranded seashore. The morning sun is only rising, still not above the horizon. Mind's eye is looking at a giant floating cube of translucent quartz rock. Wow. 
<laughs> what is it? Set and floats in the air and has six sides. It must signify something, something solid, something as one with all. Add its sides to, to its points. Six sides, four points. Subtract its edges, and you got two, not one. Mind's eye walks on further and sees a pyramid floating in space. What is this? If I look at it from above, it would be a square with an X diving in it into four triangles. Complexity. Add its sides to its points. Five sides, five points. Subtract its edges, eight, and you've got two. Mind's eye walks on and finds itself standing on a shape on the floor, a regular pentagon. What is it? Perhaps since I, I can draw a five-pointed star inside of it, it represents the five senses? Divide it into triangles any way you want. For example, this or that. Now, count the triangles and add two to find the sides. Three triangles plus two equals five sides. So you've added two. Mind's eye comes upon three more polygons on the floor and adds two to the number of triangles that can be formed in each one, finding the amount of sides each shape carries. First, I subtract two, then I add two. What is the meaning of all of this? If first you subtracted two, and then you added two, you're left with whatever you started with. If you seek me, you've already found me. It's that you even care to find me that matters to you, not to me. My mind is already set. Scene three, in the cave off the coast of Denmark, mind's eye is being struck by a vision of beautiful colors melting together. What is in my mindset? Will it stop? <laughs> the colors are to be felt, and now it's as if they are diminishing into nothingness. Will I diminish into nothingness too? White light contains all colors. There is no duality there. All of the colors' vibrations can exceed no higher. So, what is the fear in something that is only such as a being, a small leaf, being carried along in a peaceful, bubbling spring of water, drifting on the light, carried on and on further and further. Who speaks of fear? I never did. Nor am I afraid. I'm only asking you these questions since entering into this realm of wonder. Wonder at what I would ever set my mind to the knowing of anything when containing all things, floating on this stream of light and thought, I could then play with the colors of which it, which it is comprised. So you wish to play? Okay, then we will play. For a play's sake, and for the sake of playing. Yes, and being always the eyes of the audience, I'll watch all of which I contain play. The observer always, the audience, what do you mean by this? That you, are, uh, that you are forged by a creator of which nothing is greater than or that you are this creator? Of which nothing is greater than. Yes, nothing could be in excess of that which nothing is greater than. So this creator must create from mind which consumes nothing and life. I am the mind. Mm. Yes, and I'm convinced that is so. And in my conviction, my mind is set. Perhaps not all convictions are beneficial, but the, but the conviction that leads me to the perfection that I am. Perfect as you are? Yes, truly you are. For what is outside of perfection or set apart from it? Mm, thank you for drawing me de deeper into your way. Even though it be set, your set ways are what draws me even deeper into your mysteries. 
and develops the grace in my steps. Mm, yes, true. The truth inside is not known by comparing materialistic cultures, etc. What is true for the culture is not for another. And what is true in one time is not true in another. I mean, is the earth flat? And yet one or two experiences of the truth will not suffice. To be versed in the truth, we must practice living by it as much as we can. Thank you, Thank mind you, I. Mindset. <laughs> they both turn to the audience, holding small candles. A, a small, small flame, flame lights, lights up, up a big room, room in, the in the dark. dark. Imagine, Imagine what, many what many small, small flames, flames will, will do. do. End of play. First Responders by Alvin Maiden. The characters are Nurse Denise Jones, retired, CMO Gilbert, and Dr. David Blaine, also retired. The setting is the Kaiser Permanente Hospital. I am glad you all were able to make it. We really need help here. We have patients coming in left and right, and I need you all to step right in and do what's needed to save lives. Mr. Gilbert, thank you, sir. I, I'm glad I can help. Me too, sir. Can't wait to get started. You'll be pleased with our work, Mr. Gilbert. Mm. I'll have one of the nurses show you where, where you'll be working. Uh, before you leave uh, out this room, know that you'll be seeing a lot of COVID-19 patients, and some of them are on the verge of dying, some recovering. Mm. Nurse Denise speaks to a patient. Hello, I'm Nurse Jones. I'm here to take your vitals and start your IV and, and get you some air to help you breathe a little bit better. Code red, intensive care. ICU, all hands on deck. All nurses and doctors report to ICU. Yes, we have eight COVID-19 patients that just came in. So be careful and put your face mask on. Nurse Denise speaks to a patient. Hi, how you doing? I'm gonna take care of you, all right. By the way, what's your name? Joyce. Well, Joyce, we are going to take care of you, okay? I gotta check on another patient, and I'll be back later. Denise goes to the next room. Hello, Mr. Blanchard, how are you doing today? Not so good. My chest hurts. It's hard to breathe. I'm going to put you on this ventilator, all right, Mr. Blanchard, and I'll check on you later. Nurse Denise goes to the next patient's room. Hello, Cheryl? How you doing? You look great. Thanks. I feel so much better. How are you? I'm tired. <laughs> Got to finish my rounds and, and get some rest. Been on my feet all day. Well, I'll see you, all right? You take care. He goes back to Mrs. Joyce's room, pulls back the curtain to realize that the bed is empty. I wonder where she is. She steps back out into the hallway, and she stops the nurse and asks about her patient and was told she had passed away about an hour ago. The lungs wouldn't allow her to breathe. Excuse me. Ms. Jones, I heard about your patient. Sorry about that. You want to be all right? Yeah. Can you check on... Patient in room 210 for me. Thank you. And again, sorry about Mrs. Joyce. Thank you, doctor. Yes, I'll check on the patient in 210. Hi there. I'm Nurse Jones. And let's see, looking at the chart, Mr. Roberts, how are you feeling? Let me check your temperature. Wow. Your temperature is 103. I'm going to have the doctor look at you, okay? How's your breathing? I'll put you, I'll put you on a ventilator. I don't know where the patient starts seizing up. Then code red. Hand me the paddles. Anything, nurse? Nothing, doctor. Time of death. 115. This is my third patient within 72 hours. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know the rest. 
Nurse Denise stands at the nurse's station, feeling kind of woozy. She faints and passes out on the floor. Code red, code red. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, can you hear me? Let's get her into the ER. Let's get a temperature check and her vital signs. Mrs. Jones, can you hear me? Squeeze my finger if, if you can hear me. Mrs. Jones, you have tested positive for COVID-19. I'll promise you this, you will beat this. Nurse Denise, start coming too. Where am I? What happened to me? Oh, my chest and my, my side is hurting. I have the chills as well. Oh, I haven't seen anything like this in a lifetime. My whole entire career life, I pledged to save lives and now I'm fighting for mine. Nurse Denise talks to Dr. Blaine. Doctor, can you do me a favor? What is it? Can you please contact my family for me? Please. Thank you, doctor. I'll rest now, doctor. Dean Gilbert walks into Denise's room. Doctor, how is she doing? Well, she's stable, but she needs lots of rest. She'll be fine, sir. We'll put her on oxygen and monitor her status. Okay. End of scene. Scene two. Uh, we're still at Kaiser Permanente Hospital. Nurse Denise is being wheeled in from the ICU. Good morning. How are you feeling? You've been moved to the recovery room. Doctor, just how long will I be in recovery? Also, when can I go back to work and my patients need me, doctor? Well, you'll be back in record time. You just got to get your rest and I'll be back to check in on you. Okay? Rest now. Doctor, doctor, just one more thing. Can I use your phone to call my family, doctor? Please, I haven't spoken to them in weeks. Sure, yes. Here you go. Don't stay long, okay? I'll see you later. Nurse Denise makes a call. Hello? <laughs> I'm okay. I should be back at work pretty soon. Can't wait to get back to work, you know? I like helping people. So when are you all coming up? We were told there's no visiting patients with COVID-19, and, um, and I love you. I, I love you. Mwah. Well, I'm going to let you uh, get some rest. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, babe. Love you. Hangs up the phone and scrolling on the phone about the coronavirus. She makes the decision to get herself well and healthy for herself and her family. And then she dozes off. Another nurse comes and checks on Denise. Hey, girlfriend. How you doing? Here to take your temp and see if you need anything else. Temp's good. Here's more water and your meds. I'll be back to check on you, okay? Morning, doctor. I was watching the news. I hear they're asking for more help. Well, I know some folks that serve with me and, and they would be willing to step in and help, doctor. I can reach out to them. Thank you so much, Denise. This seems like the second wave of the pandemic and it's on the rise. We actually had 12 cases today. I'm going to discharge myself. I need to be back at work helping out the doctors. Do you feel it's right, Denise? As long as it's right, I'll support you all the way. I'll walk you out to your car. See you in a few days. Stay safe, stay sane, and take care. Three days later, Nurse Denise is back at work making rounds, stepping into a patient room, which seems like it was a lifetime ago. Hello, I'm Nurse Denise, and you are James. Well, how are you feeling, James? Fine. And Nurse Denise enters room 217, and she sees a patient being discharged. She begins to tear up because the patient has just beat COVID-19. As the patient exits the room, the nurses and doctors applaud. Nurse Denise has finally gotten a chance to witness the patient recover from COVID-19. 
She proceeds to making her rounds, now entering room 212, looking at the chart and realizing the patient had just given birth to a baby girl. Both mother and baby had contracted the virus. The patient is awakened by the nurse's presence. And Miss Betty says, My baby, is she okay? I don't know, but I will check for you and I'll let you know, all right? Uh, Dr. Blaine, can you tell me the condition of the patient's baby in room 212? The baby is a fighter. She's fine, but mother, she has fluid in her lungs. Mm. She'll be all right. That's good. End of play. A wedding day writing prompt by Juanjaco Hardin. Hayden will be played by Fred and Shay by Tina. She is a lawyer and the girlfriend of Hayden. We're in an upscale hotel lobby restroom, 4.30 in the evening, a half hour before the wedding. Hayden is drying his hands with a towel. Shay is waiting on him. You know what will happen if you go through with it. I've thought about it. My mind is made up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know you say that, Shay, but... If you tell Monica her fiance cheated on her today, it's gonna be ugly. I know, Hayden, but she's my girl. She needs to know. I, I don't agree, Shay. What she doesn't know won't hurt her. I don't care what you say. I'm about to tell her she's making a mistake. Baby, I'm asking you, please, please don't get involved and, and hurt her. Let go of me. I feel bad. I should have been told her. Okay, 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 okay. I'm out of here, babes. Uh, so you don't think I should say anything, Hayden? For real? Yeah, yeah, babe. I think that that's the best thing to do. Let sleeping dogs lie. Okay, baby, okay. If you say so, you always give me good advice, and I love you. I love you more, Mama. You know you're, you're my boo thang. I'm your boo thing. <laughs> you my boo thing too, baby. <laughs> they begin to walk to the altar where the wedding will be held. Yeah, daddy, let's just go enjoy this day with Monica. I love you. End of play. Now we have an untitled scene by Kamal Talib Sanders. Billy is 20 years old. His mother is Grace. She is 40 years old and we will meet Granddad, he's 70 years old. Billy and Grace are in Granddad's driveway parked outside Granddad's trailer home. They're talking in the car. Come on, Mom. Well, I gotta stay at Granddad's house. Are you serious? Why do I gotta stay at this dump? Why can't I stay with you? Because I'm going to stay with my boyfriend, Fred, and I told you the last time you messed up that if you got in trouble again, I was sending you to stay with my father. But granddad stays in a trailer. There's no room for me in there. Well, you should have thought about that before you and your friends decided to move your frat party to my house without asking. And what gave you the bright idea to barbecue in my kitchen? I didn't think anything would happen, especially not catching the kitchen on fire. Boy, mm, it's truly something wrong with you. Lighter fluid, charcoal, barbecue pits, and indoors do not mix. Now my house looks like a tornado hit it right after a house fire. Mom, just give me one more chance, please. You used up all your chances. And this was the last straw that broke the camel's back. While they're sitting in the driveway discussing what happens, Grandpa comes out of the house to take the trash out and he notices them. He walks up to the car and taps on the window. Why ain't nobody called and told me that you all y'all were outside? We tried to, Dad, but when we called, the phone kept getting a busy signal. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Betty was in there running her mouth on the phone, gossiping like usual. Busy signal? Granddad, you don't have call waiting on your cell phone? That's crazy. Cell phone? Boy, I, I don't need no cell phone. I got a landline. 
I've been having the same number since 1982. Yeah, he ain't lying. We had the same number since I was two years old. I could dial that number with Alzheimer's. 1982? Granddad, it's time to upgrade. And you got to be the only resident in Long Beach with a 213 area code. Oh, back in my day, we didn't have phones. We had, we had, a, we had Morse code. Yeah. And if you couldn't afford Morse code, uh, we had to put our letters inside a, a soda pop bottle and put them in the ocean and, and hope they made it there one day. How old are you, Grandpa? They didn't have the U.S. Postal Service then? Boy, I'm so old, my zip code is zero, 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 one. Dad, <laughs> stop telling these old when I was younger stories. You know you didn't have it like that, that bad growing up. Bad? Well, back then I thought, it, I thought it was bad. But now I look at my upbringing as a blessing because now I don't, I don't mind the struggle. Is that why you don't mind living in the trailer? And is wearing mm -hmm. payless shoes? Oh, shoes. Sure. Oh, when I was younger, we had to take a piece of a cardboard box with a string wrapped around our feet to keep them on our feet. Granddad. Well, Dad, I'm going to need you to watch your grandson. He's really messed up this time. But I got to go on the road. Okay. Well, well. Before you go, you go down down the road to the to the liquor store and and play my numbers for me, Granddad. Why you play numbers if you don't mind the struggle? Well, it's, it's just an old habit. Did I ever tell you of the story about how me and your great uncle started started the lottery? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we was the first dudes in America running numbers, Granddad. <laughs> So if you hit the lottery, would you buy a new house, car, shoes, and a wardrobe? You see that 1954 10 speed over there? I've been having that since I was 20 and my dad had it since he was 20 and I don't need no car. You know how much money I save on gas? Dad, <laughs> I gotta go. Let me go play your numbers so I can get on the road. End of scene. Life Change by Tyrell Williams. The characters are TJ, an 18-year-old young man, and Deaver, 40 or 40-year-old 40 father of TJ. The setting is the front yard of their house. At Rise, uh, Deaver and TJ are sitting outside in the front yard when TJ's friends pull up. Son, didn't I tell you I don't want you hanging out with them good, no good dudes? Well, Pops, they're my dogs. I trust them. What do you mean, trust them? Hanging with them dudes gonna have you dead or in jail. Don't go in my footsteps. You better than me. Man, Pops, I'm living this life right here. I'm all in with this stuff. Son, you are not what you think you are. Them streets will eat you alive, trust me. I'm happy I made it out so I could be here for you. If you live this long, don't you think you should be teaching me how to live as long as you did, Pops? I'm all in. And it is what it is, Pop. TJ, I don't want to lose my only son to the streets. There's so much more you can do with your life. What is this gang giving you? What is it doing for you, huh? What do you mean what the gang doing for me? They're my homies. And they're going to have my back like I got theirs. Them dudes don't got your back. How many times I got to tell you, you will see in due time. But God got your back. That's the only person you need to have your back, and me. Just like you had mom's back, God didn't ha have her back when they said she died, huh? Come here, son. I'm sorry about your mom. I think about it every day. That's why I'm trying to save you. Man, I got to go, Pops. My homie's waiting on me. I'll be back later. Wait, son. Where are you going? Please don't do anything that's going to have you in. Please, I don't want to lose you, son. Chill, Pop. I'm not. I'm just about to go hang out with, my, with a few girls. That's all. Smoke some good, good. I love you, Pops. 
I love you too, son. Call me to let me know where you at and that you're safe. End of scene. Scene two. Deaver and TJ are in the prison waiting room and they're talking. What's up, son? How you holding up in here? I hope everything's okay. Yeah, I'm good, Pops. Thank you for that money you sent me. I needed that. I know I've been through this many times. This is what I was trying to keep you away from. They don't love you. You are your homies. They don't love you. Not like I do. Don't get me wrong. You're going to have something to look out. That's a real friend. It's not too many of those, though. Yeah, I see what you're talking about, Pops. Nobody want to pick up my phone calls. And dude told the police everything just to go home. Yeah. Son, man, I love you, son. I tried everything in my body to keep you away from this life. I don't know. I was so blind to know you started following in my footsteps, man. Pops, it ain't on you, man. I just got to stand up as a man and get myself out of this. How you going to do that? I didn't make it to you the first court date. I had a meeting. What did they say? How much time did they say you're looking at? What are they talking about? They offered me 15 years with 85%. But I told them I'm not taking anything. Okay, son. I'm going to get you a lawyer. Don't say anything. You're going to come home real soon. Keep your mouth shut, your head high, and your chest out. Okay, Pops. How you doing out there? How was work? I know you got a lot on your on your mind, and I just add to it. When this is over, I went out. I'm good, son. Don't worry about me. I got this out here. You take care of everything in there. I'm going to make sure you got money on your books and on my phone so you can call. Thank you, Pops. I love you. I love you too, son. I miss you being at home. Say your goodbyes. Visiting hours are over now. End of scene. Scene three. Months later on a bright Sunday morning, We're in front of Lancaster State Prison. TJ is getting out of prison. <laughs> What's up, son? Man, I couldn't wait to, to the day will come to see you get out of that place, man. Pops, man. It feels good to be home, to smell the fresh air. But Pops, I'm serious. I want out. You want out? Then you're going to have to start going to church with me. And I mean every Sunday. Let God show you the way of life. Yeah, Pops. Whatever you say. Every Sunday I'm there with you. I need God in my life in a big way. That life is over for me. I saw what you was talking about this whole time. That's what I'm happy to hear you say, man. I see them two years in that six by six and told you everything. I told you it's a waste of time being in there. It's too much outside to be stuck in that place. Yeah, you're right about that. I'll never go back there. Before I take anybody money again, I'll work my butt off for mine, Pops. I'm happy you came to the right mind. I've told you many and many times. It's two ways in life, dead or in jail with life. Yeah. I've seen a lot of dudes my age, they got a long time, or some of the same guys I was running around with are dead now. Now you see what Pops was talking about. All I want is the best for you, man. I can't lose you to the streets or to prison. Pops, 
You won't. I'm right here by your side. I wouldn't know what to do, man, if I lost you. But I'm happy you're home. I love you, too. And I'm happy to be home, Pop. Love you, too. You will never see me go back there again. All right, man? All right. Play. Juiced by Robert Ishmael Smith. Little Red is a teenage apple, a red delicious. We also have Sun Kissed, a golden delicious teenage apple as well. We're in the apple orchard in a tree. It is morning. The two apples are talking to one another, hanging out on a branch. I don't understand you. You wake up one morning and poof. You have this idea? It's not an idea. It's a sensation, an awareness, so to speak. I, I feel it in my pulp, in my core. Pulp fiction. That's what you're feeling? You're just apprehensive. You're almost right. You're ready to leave the orchid. You're unsure about life. I don't understand all that. Uh, you don't understand. How could you? You represent the family tree. Everyone depends on you. you you're the standard apple, the poster boy, the red delicious. When, when you drop seed, you'll be planted and planted again for generations to come. Your future is set. Me, me, not so much. That's what I mean, Sonny D. You're apprehensive. You can't compare yourself to me. I'm not. I'm seedless. I'm different. I know I'm different. You're just you. You're not different. You're just you. Listen, Red, I'm not like, like, like the rest of the bunch. Y'all are hard bodies and hard headed. Me, I'm bright, refreshing. I'm fragrant. <sighs> I'm citrus. I'm juicy. Whoa. That's fruity. Stop that. That's what I've been trying to tell you. I'm an orange. Huh? End of scene one. Scene two, we introduce Granny Smith, an elder, very understanding apple. They're at the large tree in the center of the grove at sunset. They're on a branch sitting with Granny, an apple on either side of her. Grandma, we really need you. Can you please come talk to Sunkiss? What's wrong, baby? He thinks he's an orange. I, I am, Granny. I, I can feel it. I'm just, I'm just not an apple like the rest of you. I'm different. Well, baby, sometimes you might feel different. You might even act differently, but that doesn't make you different. That makes you unique. No, I'm not unique. There are millions of oranges just like me in, my same, in the same situation. God made a mistake. God put me in an apple body, but I ain't no apple. I'm an orange, 100%. That's stupid. Look around. Ain't nothing but apples in this grove. Apples to the core. And ain't nothing but apples been in this grove. Don't speak on things you don't know about. We were imported into this country. We are immigrants. You don't know what was planted here before we came. This land has a history and there is plenty of blood and sweat in this soil. You don't know who or what was uprooted so we could grow here. This land was tilled, planted upon, and planted upon again until we found our place and took root. As long as we bear fruit, we have a place. This is our place now. We have been here so long, we don't know where we come from or, or what was uprooted for us. I'm sorry. I don't want to go back to the days of soil tilling and cotton picking or nothing. I was just talking about sun kids being fruity. It's weird. No, it's not. You can't tell him what he's feeling inside. Some apples are sweeter than others. 
we can tell him the reality and support him in, in his choices. And the reality is, son, kiss baby, you are an apple. Genetically, it's impossible to be an orange. You just have juice life according to the taste you're given. Do you know they've been playing at genetics, splicing, and chemical injections for years. The scientists have been, been proving God wrong since, since for, forever. How, how is it possible that every one of you have seeds and I'm seedless? Boy, you better watch your stem. I'll slap the side out of you. The life of an apple is a wonderful thing. We've been chosen to sustain life on this planet. There is power in being an apple. God chose us to change the course of human existence. We are the symbol of free choice. Man chose us over God. God don't make mistakes. Apple cider, apple sauce, apple juice, apple pie, ain't no orange pie, apple butter, apple jacks, apple bottom. Oh, I'm an orange. I don't care what anyone says. I'll show you. I'll show, I'll show you all. I'm, I'm going to be the most famous orange in the world. You'll see. Oh, 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 oh. Sonny. You'll see. Sonny. Sonny, come back. It's okay, baby. Sometimes you got to find out about life by living life. He'll be okay. Don't worry. End of scene two. Scene three, and we now have Detective Squeeze, a human police detective. Officer Drinkmaker, a human police officer. Dr. Smoothie, a forensic scientist. It is nighttime somewhere in Brentwood, California, an alley in front of an apartment building. Detectives are collecting samples of liquid and bagging them for evidence. Two dead bodies lay across the walkway with two pieces of rotting fruit on the ground, one at the head of each body. Scientists move in and out of the scene, appearing to be testing samples of evidence. Wow, what a mess. Someone must have been really angry. Yeah, it looks that way. What are you thinking? Someone surprised him? Huh? I suppose. Look at this. A brown coconut. They split mm. it down to the white meat. So that's what that is. Coconut oil or coconut milk. Mm. He dips a cotton swab into the substance and bags it. Don't assume nothing, rookie. We can't afford to make that mistake. These days, everything ain't what it appears to be. Just stick to the basics. Bag it and tag it. The science point us in the right direction. Look at this. He reaches down and picks up an apple. Oh my God, they chopped the sauce out of this one. Damn, it's apple slices all over the place. Yeah, this was personal. A crime of passion fruit. I think someone surprised him. Maybe hiding in the tree, behind those vines, or in that bush over there. No, I think the attack was on this guy and this guy here surprised the attacker, and became a victim himself. Look at this. A kitchen glove. A what? A kitchen glove. You think it has something to do with this? Nah, get rid of it. He places the glove in his pocket. This scene is a mess. I'm confused. I think everyone's confused. The victims, the suspect, the apple, and the coconut. Everyone. Hey, Doc! Yes, Detective? What do we have? Well, the science never lies. We deal mostly with what is not as opposed to what is more like deduction. That is true evidence. Uh, so what does that mean? Okay, we have here coconut milk. And this here, applesauce. This here, coconut oil, and this here, blood spatter, and this. Yeah, what is that? That is orange juice. Orange, orange juice. juice. Orange, orange juice. juice. 
Oh. Oh, oh Jerry, Jerry did, did it. it. End of play.